Hey friends, I dressed up real nice today to talk about filming people who dress up real nice, aka corporate interviews and how to nail them. So when I'm out doing a very professional, polished, corporate style video, this is my setup for 2020. So again, I dressed up real nice to talk about men and women that also dress up real nice, but I tricked you. I'm actually rocking Zoom Drip. So when I go out and do a corporate shoot like this, I like to do like a medium and a tight shot. I try to stay away from any sort of a wide shot for an interview because it's really hard for me to try to match the depth of field with different lenses and wide shots. Typically everything seems to be sharp and in focused. And I rarely ever do that unless I'm doing something where like, you know, you're talking to a tire manufacturer and you set up the guy in front of a bunch of tires, but I never do that, I actually hate it. So the room we were working with was actually really nice because it was big, there was a lot of space, a lot of depth to it. It wasn't too noisy or echoey in there. It was carpeted, which was good. And there was some really interesting kind of art on the back wall and some different variants that I could use to just create an interesting frame for such a, on paper, boring video even though no video is ever boring if it's the right audience, right? For lighting, my key light is the C120D, which is has aged really, really well. Now it has a beautiful double diffuse softbox, as you know, and it's a daylight balance light, and so it just comes wrapping around the face of the subject, which is so important. But actually, for my rim light, I did a tungsten flavor gel on the front of my little panel to just create some color contrast right there on the face of the subject. And my third light that I used was actually splashing on the back wall to give a little bit more shine to the back art and just make it a little bit more interesting because this particular shoot was gonna include no B-roll at all, just like text and graphics and charts. So I wanted it to just look as nice as possible for the people that were supposed to watch this in its entirety. So I think it worked out pretty well because it just enhanced a little bit of that art in the fall off. Um, I was using a really shallow depth of field with a wide open open fast lens, the uh, 85-1.4 which is an L series from Canon for my main tight shot. And uh, just the, the contrast of the colors, I thought looked really, really pleasing and it just turned out really nice. So from an audio standpoint, of course I'm rocking the Rode MTG3, which is the best mic you can buy under $1,000 for any sort of field dialogue recording in a filmmaking context. However, I just got a mic from Deity that I'll be reviewing and I might need to recant that statement if I find different results in my review of that mic, so watch out. <laughs> and of course that was signaled into the Zoom F6, which is my my recorder of choice when I'm a one-man show out there because I don't have to mess with the dials really at all, even though I'll still try to dial it in just to be safe. But you know the F6 is unclippable, and if you record with absolutely no gain, you can boost it in post and have the clean, clear, pure, beautiful signal that you just dreamed about. So that's a cool chain. It's real simple. It's powered by a Sony NPF style battery, and it just lasts all day, all night, all next day too. Now there was a little bit of an audio issue in the room. There was a refrigerator plugged in there with some snacks and drinks in it, and we had to pull that plug to get that air or that cooling compressor to turn off because those kind of come on and off intermittently, which is really annoying. We killed the HVAC for the room itself, but there was like a building wide uh, airflow system on that did make a constant sound that the mic picked up, but with a little bit of room tone that was really easy to clean up. And even if you don't have isotope or an advanced tool using auditions, noise reduction will help tremendously with a very even and constant noise in the background as long as you get a little bit of room tone. Room tone meaning just recording complete silence for like 15 or 20 seconds to give the computer a chance to isolate and remove it. So listen to this quick example of what it sounded like out of the recorder with that HVAC thing on, and then when I processed it and how clean and just nice it sounds. Too many firms try to be all things to all clients and end up really spreading themselves too thin and they don't have the expertise to go deep. So when you drill down on your... So as far as cameras, I use the C100 and the C100 Mark II. These are cameras that I actually own and have used since the beginning of my professional career in filmmaking, and they're excellent, both of them. The C100 Mark II especially, it's my main camera. I use it for everything, unless I'm doing a bigger project and I rent a C200 to just get you know a little bit more of a flex on somebody. It's got better autofocus, it's got 4K and all those things that are sometimes important, but for the most part not. Now the C100 Mark II is an old camera. It came out in 2014. That was six years ago. And in camera time, that is ancient. And look, this camera doesn't even shoot in 4K. It's old. It shoots only 60 frames a second. It's 1080p. It doesn't have anything cool like a full frame or an in-body image stabilization. But I use it because it's f***ing cinematic. Now look, there, there is a camera arms race out there. These companies are just putting out camera after camera after camera. Each one serves a different style of filmmaking or a different use. You know, if you're a vlogger, you're not gonna want the C100 unless you're me and you put it on a 
on a Joby when you go to VidSummit, because I did that. But for the most part, each one fits in its own place. And I know there's so much sexual arousal on the internet about camera releases. I get that, I'm not really in that camp. I'm really satisfied with my C100 Mark II. It's a great camera. And let's, and can we just like stop arguing and getting so offended about cameras on the internet? Can we just please like cut that? <laughs> I mean, argue with me in the comments if you want to about this. I want to get offended. I want to feel personally offended about cameras today. I think it'd be great. Okay, so there's there's one more thing I want to address past all the technical specs. Look, I was paid to do this shoot. It was very professional. The client complimented my work. They were satisfied. Everything was fine. I did a good job. And so that's one of the reasons I'm sharing. But the other one is I think that so many filmmakers, especially younger ones like myself a few years ago, tend to miss the point. And the point of these types of interviews is, is the person that's sitting right there in that chair. And so if we back up a little bit from all the gear and specs and technical things to make it look good, sound good, and just overall be good, the heart of the video is that person and what they're sharing and how they're sharing. And so if you look at marketing as storytelling, or if you look at an internal teaching video like this one was actually for clients of this consulting firm, as like storytelling and human advancement and, and just bringing people more knowledge and growth. I mean, there is a real purpose behind all videos that we make. And so that person being comfortable and confident while sitting in that chair is of the utmost importance. And so I think one of my gifts as a filmmaker is my ability to empathize and connect with people. And so the first, the second they sit down in the chair, I ask them, are they comfortable? Do you need a glass of water? Uh, do you need to go over your notes or anything? Do you want to talk about this process? I'll lay out some ground rules for you. Don't look at the camera, look at me. Do your best to work the question back into your answer because we won't be hearing from me, stuff like that. But I just want to make sure that they're comfortable right there because if they're comfortable and confident, they're going to share to their best ability whatever it is they need to share for the people that need to consume it. Because there is no such thing as a boring video. There's just videos for the wrong audience. There are people in accounting firms that are gonna eat this alive because they're learning from these people a better way to do their job. And that's critically important. That's why there was value shown. I was paid money to make this for this company because they value the information they're providing and they're gonna get paid by people who value what's in those videos to go through this little course and get better at what they do. And so one of the mistakes I think I see often when I'm on a set that I'm either running or just a part of is if an interviewee is uncomfortable, people on set tend to just quickly say, oh my gosh, you're doing great, you're doing fine, like everything's fine, you're doing great. And I honestly hate that. I stay away from saying that ever because it's a lie. They're not doing fine. They're struggling, they're, they're nervous. They, they've never sat in front of a big light and a fancy mic and a big camera staring right at their face. This is a pressure moment. They're vulnerable. And so to address that and validate that for them actually I think makes them settle down and realize like, okay, it is, it is uncomfortable and that's okay. And we're all here to make this the best we can. So like, there's no pressure. And you know, I'll do the line of like, look, this isn't a news broadcast, we're gonna cut this up. So just relax, take as many time, take as many takes as you need. And that sometimes works, but for the most part, validating people's uncomfort is critically important. Saying, hey, I, it looks like you're kind of uncomfortable here. Is there something I can do to make this a little better? Do you want some of these people to leave the room? You want me to turn on the AC for a quick second, cool it down? Can I get you a glass of water, a beer? I mean, just validating that it is an uncomfortable process if you don't do this every day, I think brings, a lot, brings people a lot of comfort and helps them to settle in. So don't forget, that's the heart of all video production. Even this right here, you watching it, if you've made it this far in the video, it's because you're gleaning value from it, or you just like me, or both. And that's what is the heart of the whole thing. Not my fancy coat, or the way I've lit myself, or the frame I've made here in my apartment in Brookside. So keep that in mind every time you go on a job. There is a heart that you are connecting with and you are helping people either learn, grow, be inspired, or in general to flourish by your excellence. So your excellence, which is the technical goodness and making people feel at ease, is going to bless other people and help them create excellence in their own life. It's a great circle of goodness. If you give goodness with your talents, people receive goodness and then go give it in their own way. And a lot of problems in the world would be solved if we all just owned our work like that all the time. If we could just own ourselves like that, own our reactions, own our emotions, own our experience, our behavior, our histories, and just spread goodness. 
Not in a cliche way, not in a cliche way either. That's a, that's a big thing. And even me in this video right now is owning some level of goodness. This is actually a re-upload. The first one I uploaded, I was out of focus for some of the beginning of the video because my C100 Mark II had, a trouble, had trouble on my face with the backlit uh, daytime out there. And I was challenged by somebody who said they can't trust a vlogger who can't even get himself into focus. I was offended by this. I acted like a turkey and called him a hater because he was picking out that one little point and missing the point of the video. Well, guess what? That video was not excellent because I did cut corners and I just wanted to get it out to the point that I actually wasn't proud of the final product. And so after acting like a turkey to this individual, I'm deciding to now do the right thing and make a video that is perfectly in focus the entire time and polished and nice so it's not a distraction from the heart of this video. So here I am admitting a mistake and owning everything. Ownership, I'm talking. What would like, what would the world look like if we all just owned ourselves? <laughs> like, I own it. I did it, I'm making it better. <laughs> I'm in charge of myself. <laughs> so anyway, this concludes the video. Technical excellence is important. Relational excellence is also important. Go out there, make good stuff. And I'll see you in the next video.